uh, so far. I hope um, what we talked about last time didn't uh, get much, much in a cloud of confusion. Uh, I want to start tonight by just um, uh, saying a few things about last week. First of all, I, I was thinking about how it went last week. And when I was, after I left here last week, I was not too happy about with myself about how it went. And the reason was because I think we got a little bit off track. And there's a, one other thing I'll share with you just a moment beside that. But I have to, I had to go back and I had to look at why I'm doing this, why we're having this, this class. And the, the title of the class is Foundations for a Biblical Faith. So that being said, there's a lot of things in Genesis chapters one through everything. <laughs> Specifically, one through four or five, what we're going to be focusing on. There's a lot of stuff in there which we could dive into and really get involved in some deep discussions. But I, and what I was thinking about was, you know, that's pretty neat, but that's not the purpose of this class. So I, I, had, to, I had to back up a little bit and rethink what I wanted to talk about a little bit because I want to I wanted just highlight those pieces of the text that support the goal of the class. There's a lot here to talk about, and I would, be, I would be happy to talk about it, but we only have another couple of weeks, and this is not a semester, so we can't talk about everything. So what I want to do is I want to just back up a little bit and, and just say a couple of things. Um, one of the things I want to do is, is reiterate the purpose of this class. And I think um, I think you all know this, but this this was just a reset for me. Uh, half, about halfway through the the six the seven session we're going to have, so I just wanted to say um, uh, uh, read from the initial document that I handed out to you. It's called the purpose of the study, and I want to go back and say um, that. The church in general and, and the, the synagogue as well has departed from a lot of biblical teachings because tradition, some traditions have got in the way and we've gone down paths that are not consistent with biblical understanding. And not, not coincidentally, these departures from the biblical doctrine and specifically the doctrine of the Christ have removed much of the content needed for Bible-believing community today to be able to discern the signs of the times. These departures have produced a catastrophic loss of historical situational awareness, making the believing communities extremely vulnerable to the deceptions of Satan, which he has reserved for such a time as this. This scenario fits the warning given to us by Yeshua in Matthew 24, 24 <coughs> regarding the elect. And based upon this handicapping paralysis of discernment and a potentially devastating impact on the believing community, this study has been created as a discipling effort to edify and support the believing community. The goal here is to help the believing community understand and discern, discern the signs of the times more accurately and more coherently in order to abide in the faith as this generation's future un unfolds. So that is that is my purpose. Is that what I what's what's burdened in my heart is the fact that the Jewish Christian believing community has headed off on tangents based upon traditions. And so what I what I would like to do is just try to bring us back to a, 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 a an essentially an essential foundation on the first couple of chapters of Genesis, which from there should launch us into our future of understanding doctrine. Now, that being said, one of the things that I wanted to repent of was something that uh, you, uh, Ellen brought to my attention, is that uh, in our conversation last week, we kind of departed from Peshat and just leaped headlong into doctrine. And uh, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, it's really easy for me to do that because the doctrines I see down here in New Testament fit in really nice with what we're teaching in, in Genesis. So it's very easy to just leave. And so I did that. So I apologize for that. I want to bring us back to just, just as much as possible staying with the shot. Now I will tell you that before this class is done in a couple of weeks, 
I will do that just to give you some sense of, of, of how things are connected with the doctrines of, of our future. But I don't mean to do that right now. I just, I just want to reestablish the, uh, the foundational structure upon which we can launch those doctrines. And we talked, that, we talked about that uh, extensively and we will continue to talk about that. One is Socrates and one is Moses. So we want, to, we want to migrate from a lot of our teachings and traditions that are based upon Socrates and move back into the world of Moses. So with that being said, I will move now towards something else I wanted to touch base on that we talked about last week. And let me get the document out here. talked extensively about the firmament in Genesis uh, 1 6 I think it is <coughs> so I want to preface that and we're going to go back to that right now but I want to preface that by saying this is that the writer of Genesis Moses Moses wrote to us in Genesis that this is true based upon what we see and what God told us the, the language of Hebrew is very <laughs> very um, experiential, it's very concrete, it's very down to earth, and it's based a lot in fact on, on experience. So what, what we have in the, in the Hebrew language and culture is we have statements of truth that are based upon experience. And God says, you see how this season goes? This is part of the truth. You see how day and night goes? This is part of the truth. So God has built into our experience all we need to know about our future, but he's done it in such a way that he's given us a text called Torah to help explain our experience. And that's where we go from there. So um, here we have, here we have uh, something that I put together this week just to kind of address something there. So everything that we have is objects of, of, of experience. However, uh, there's more to truth than meets the eye. In other words, if I go outside and just look at the stars and the moon and what and the trees, I see what's there, I know the experience of it, I know the experience of, of winter, spring, summer, fall, I know the experience of day and night, I know the experience of, of, of the, the phases of the moon, and those are very concrete items. But there's more to, there is more, just, to, just because we say that it's a concrete truth, it doesn't mean that there's more of a depth. There's more of a depth. Remember that the, the uh, part A structure of interpretation goes from Peshat, which is literal, simplest, Remez, with, which is a hint, and then Darash, which is a sermon that you, that you can get out of it, and then so. So it goes all the way from, goes all the way from physical, literal, all the way up to what we might call mystical. But in the, in the mystical, we have those kinds of things where we we think about layers of allegory and metaphor that can be applied as well. So allegory and metaphor is not bad. The bad part of using metaphor and allegory is when we use that to contradict what Peshat says. Mm -hmm. If we use metaphor and allegory to contradict Peshat, then we're, then we're off base. So there's nothing wrong with it, but it's gotta be kept in mind with Peshat. So there's nothing wrong with um, with those advanced ways of looking at things. But the problem, the challenge that we have is that we don't even know what Peshat is yet. So how can we talk about the mystical things if we're not even in the same ballgame? We're in Socrates. How can we talk about the, the, the metaphors and allegories that are appropriate for Moses? We, we're not there yet. So what we talked about last, uh, last week was uh, was uh, the firmament. We got kind of hung up on that, and I apologize for that. Um, I, we got hung up on for two reasons. One is I let it go that direction deeply, which is a very important subject, but it really is, as I said just a moment ago, it's really not germane to the purpose of this class. It's important, but it's not germane to the purpose of this class. But I want to explain a couple things. When we look at, when we look at, at the verses, uh, in Genesis 1 and it talks about water. It's significant that water is a dual plural. 
And we see, we see right here, water. And the word, the, the word for water literally in Hebrew is mai, M-A-I. But that word is never used in the Bible. It's, it's always used in its plural form. But it's not just a plural, it's a dual plural. Remember how I explained that? Where um, whenever the, I, the ending of a word is in ayi, that is a dual plural. And, and water is my <clears throat> So that it's significant that there's a dual plural here, that, uh, dual al duality attached to the word water. And I believe that this is because you have the waters above and the waters below. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The other word here is, is the word for heavens, right here. And here you have the word shemai, which means lofty. And here's how it's written in the Bible, shemai. You never have shemai in the Bible. It never appears in its singular form. It always appears in its dual form. It's dual plural. So there's a significance between this and this. In that it's, it's, it's the heavens. Now this word here, which is a dual as well, <coughs> is from the word shameh, shameh. Now this is, where I, this is where I made a mistake last week and I want to correct that. Shameh is, is, not a, is not associated with these two words at all. But it is a dual. It, it is a dual as well. And so, so it's used as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a word that means lofty. So when the, when the, when the Israelites would look at the sky, the way they, what they saw what we see in scripture is not, they were not scientists trying to analyze what they're seeing, but they were trying to, dis, to discuss or trying to say was what they saw. And what they saw was the heavens, the, the water above, and then God put a, put a firmament in between, and that word is rakia, and that rakia, we might even consider that in our, in our novice amateur way, mine especially, we might even consider that the atmosphere. But they were looking through the atmosphere to the sky and saw the birds flying up there, they saw the sun and moon, they saw the stars, and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So what they were looking at was a portrait to them on the sky. They didn't know how far away the moon was, or the sun was, or the stars were. All they saw was the portrait in the sky. And these, these things were put in the sky by the Creator to give us uh, the, the signs and the seasons, the, the, the signs of the times, the Moedim. Okay, that's all they say about it. That's what it says. Now, if we go down to, if we go down to verse six here. I have a question. Yes. Can you make that larger? No. Yeah. Okay, so this is verse six. And so based upon the way I looked at the words this past week, I want to change the way I, I set up last week. So then God said, let there be a permanent, a rakia in the middle, and it says midst, and the word the word there for midst is the word I wrote down here, betok, which means which means middle, and it's a, it's a, it's a it's a form. This is the root word tavek, but this is the word that's in the scripture. This is the root, and this is the scripture. And what it means, it, it only means it's a, the, this form of of, of uh, betok is only used to mean middle when it's addressing pairs of things. Hmm. So when you have Mayim, 
above and below, rakia is going to separate them to the two of them, and it's going to be called vetok. It's going to be a dividing point which divides the upper waters from the lower waters. Does that make sense? see some big question marks. <laughs> but, so what's the question? What, what are the questions? This may not apply to everyone else. What is the relevance of this topic? How does this fit into everything, I guess? It doesn't. Oh, okay. But I'm, I'm just saying, I, I want to clarify because I said it wrong last okay. time. Okay. okay. So it, it is good to know, but it's not relevant for biblical foundation, unless we want to just expand our awareness of how the Hebrews thought. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, yeah. so, so we have the upper waters, the, the upper waters separated by the, the firmament, and then we were, the, the question now is, where is the lower waters? So we continue to read here. It says, and God, in verse eight here, and God called the firmament, heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters <coughs> under the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So the waters under the heaven are referencing the oceans, the seas. Okay? So so the, the waters low on the, under the heavens are the seas, which the appearance of land breaks through. So you have the upper separated by the firmament, which we'll call sky to make it simple. Upper waters separated by the sky, lower waters, and then the earth, the earth comes through. All right, so I hope, I hope that lessens any confusion I caused last week. <coughs> I do have some other things here, which, which just follow up on what I said here. If you would like this document, I'd be happy to share it with you sometime. So we'll, we'll just close that right now and move on. Okay, so moving on, I want to also share with you um, some another another thought that I was I think was relevant. As I was going back and researching permanent and going through all this all this uh, evaluation, and as I continue to research uh, the text itself for this class, it occurred to me. That when we when we have a when we believe that the Bible says what it says, it means what it says, and says what it means. If we really believe that, then we have to know that we have a different we have a, a Hebrew view of the reality of creation. Because one of those part of that that comes out of that, and this is relevant to this class, part of that part of what comes out of that is a is a notion of how history is unfolding. Now, and I say that because in the garden, everything was perfect before sin, right? They were sinless, they had perfect relationships, they had immortality, and they were, they were scheduled to live forever if they were obedient to the Creator by not taking of that fruit. So they started with perfection. So what happened when sin entered? Things corrupted and you know, long story short, it went from perfect to chaos. Went from perfection to death, to dust. So it started out in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 as chaos, as we started out. It was brought from chaos into a ordered, structured universe in, where, in which life was put and meant to be eternal. Lucifer came in and, and, and deceived the man and the woman and they ate of the fruit and then chaos came back, and we call that chaos death. So what we see in history is this. We see that we started out with perfection in the garden, and then as time went on, as history unfolded, people did not get better. Cultures did not evolve to a better state. Things went downhill. It was, it was yet after a period of time, what happened with the planet and the creation. God said, the earth stinks, there's violence. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm, I'm, you know, we're gonna, I'm tired of this, I'm gonna destroy everything with water. 
So he destroyed everything with water, saved a few people. And then after that, same thing happened. What happened after that? Mankind decided to make it stink again. And he, and he went and, and, uh, and built the Tower of Babel. And so you have all of this cultural thing so that from then until now, you have, a, you, have, you have a devolution of culture. You have a devolution of value. You have a devolution of life. You have all this stuff that's, that's going back towards chaos so throughout the whole length of history as we know it. I say that what's brought this to my attention specifically was that uh, in my studies, I was reading some of, the, some of these theologians that were commenting on, on Genesis. And they were they were buying into this idea that, that you know we are culturally evolved, and so the the uh, the teaching of Genesis it was a Hebraic culture back then, but we've so far superseded that that we don't have to understand it literally anymore. We are we are higher intelligence than they were. We have evolved in our culture and understanding. We have science behind us, and now we can we can take all of that as metaphor and allegory because we have evolved to a better understanding of things. Our archaeology, our anthropology, our science, our biology, everything has put us in a position where we are far more advanced than those primitive peoples. You see, you see the contrast here we have? They see, they being those folks that buy into that, see that we have this evolution towards a place where we understand things better by our science, by the authority of our various sciences. What we believe though, it's because we believe because this is what it says. And we don't have to go any further than that. We can if the science correlates it, and, and in many cases it does, which is why we have the Creation Science Museum and we have uh, creation, uh, creation Institute and all that kind of stuff. So it does, it does correlate if you look at the evidence and, and apply biblical principles, but the world system is not accepting it. They're going the opposite direction. For us then, we have to know what it says and believe what it says. And, and, and from that point, it's just, it's just where our faith takes us and what it says. Now, what we're, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to understand what it says and not corrupt its understanding by bringing in our traditions. <laughs> Cultural evolution. Does that make sense? To you? Yes. Okay. Now, also, in the same line of, of thinking, if Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden with God, with the Creator, we would we would probably think that the source of knowledge for them would have been directly from him. We don't know how long they were in the garden, but they had this access to the creator of the garden, and they could have asked him, and he probably taught them a lot of things before they decided to eat of the fruit. So two things about that. One is that when we go through history, we have to know that the propagation of knowledge comes from a single source. Whatever knowledge started out in the garden, it was, it was single sourced out to all of the populations of descendants. And just like that telephone game, the populations of the earth that grew out of that single mom and dad uh, ancestry, they corrupted it, you know, in their own way of thinking and in their own, their own mistakes of passing it on to their kids. So the knowledge that was propagated was a degenerative knowledge and it kept getting more degenerative. But what we need to know about that is that when we, when we have, an, when we have a, 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 an academic person who wants to tell us that Babylonia and Assyria had their flood stories, and so the, 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 uh, the Hebrew stories just took some of theirs, took some of the Egyptians, took some of the Babylonians, and they put it together in their own version of it. We can, we can know that's just the opposite. The Hebrews didn't assemble their own version. <coughs> they had the version that was correct and everybody else borrowed from them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Everybody else bothered, borrowed from them because it was a corruption over time, just as it goes through that telephone game. So the propagation of knowledge was corrupting as it went through time. And it was the reason why these other cultures had similar stories of the flood, for example, was because they came from Adam and Eve. Right. So um, man was in the garden. If you look at your if you look at your handout for day three. There's a few things. There's a few things we want to cover here, real quick, because this, these are some of the things that we're going to talk about as foundational. We've already talked about Hebrew as the fundamental language, and I think we're all in agreement about that. We know that God intended to dwell with man. We talked about the sanctuary and all that, um, and He built this. And I do have a. Let me see if I can find it real quick. There's all kinds of references in Scripture that indicate the heart of God. We don't, we don't get too much of this heart in, in the foundational text of Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. But we do get some of it when we look at that first word for brooding. Remember we talked about that? In that time of brooding that the Creator did, He was just anticipating, He was anticipating as a mother hen the development of His, of his uh, creation. But we know from various various scriptures that, that came out later that uh, he wants he wants to be their God. He wants to dwell with them. He wants to dwell with the children of Israel and be their God. And we see this these kinds of things where he said all the way up to and included, including the end of the book of Revelation. When we come to new heavens and new earth, it says that now God is with us. <laughs> now he dwells among us. So it's it's a, it's very clear that God created the creation so that he could, he could dwell with us and among us and, be, and be, have it be in a relationship with him, in a loving relationship with him. In that garden, he created seeds and the, he planted the seeds. Chapter two talks about the fact that, what, that Initially, the seeds were planted and nothing had grown up because there was no, no rain. <coughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll read that shortly. And so at, when, at, instead of the raining, the mist went up and then the seeds grew up and God told Adam, you see all these trees, you can eat all the fruit of these trees except for this one. And so he was, he was going through that, that, uh, that teaching session with them on that. Man was made in the image of the Creator. We've talked about to some extent here. And there's a lot to be said about that. Uh, there's a lot to be said that we know about, and there's a lot that we don't know about that we probably can't talk about because there's not enough evidence. But it, it certainly tells us that there's a diversity in the God, in God. There's a diversity of, of uh, character, of maybe a person, just as there is a diversity in me, where I have my mind, which is not, corpor it's not physical, but I do have my body, which is physical. So if I lose my mind or I lose my body, either way, I lose me. <laughs> I'm, you know, it's, it's, I gotta have both. Man is not autonomous. Man exists only insofar as he's obedient. He was given a great deal of authority in the garden. He was, he was given authority to rule creation but he was not autonomous. He could not just do things the way he wanted to. He was, he was under the authority of the Creator. And as long as he was under the authority, he would continue to have, have the uh, liberty to exercise his authority. <clears throat> Man was in the garden on the Sabbath in the context of eternity. Man was put into the garden on the Sabbath. And we'll read here in chapter 2 shortly that God put... Adam and Eve in the garden to rest. And we'll see that in the scriptures. So let's go and, and start reading chapter 2 then. <coughs> now I 
usually look at the New King James Version, but uh, I like to facilitate some of our understanding. <coughs> I'm, I've got Young's literal translation here. And uh, I, I don't think that he captured everything just right, but, but in my way, so much of what he says is a little bit more accurate than the way uh, it's usually translated. So um, I'll, I, let's, let's go ahead and do this. And uh, let, me, let me just go ahead and read, read it. I think that's probably the best way to get it done uh, for the moment. And the heavens and the earth are completed and all their hosts. And by the way, let me just comment real quick. In the Hebrew, it's usually written in a present tense. So you'll, you'll see that it comes across by Young's literal most of the time in the present tense. English translators, uh, for example, with the New King James or any other, other translation, they'll usually fit the statement to the context of a time frame and say future or past. Now there is there is a there is a specific verb form to indicate future, but we'll see that here. <clears throat> and God completeth by the seventh day His work. And remember, we talked about that word "work," which is the malchuto, which is that purposeful work. We talked about that last week, <laughs> which He had made and ceased ceased by the seventh day from all His work, which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, for in it he had ceased from all his work that God had prepared for making. Verse 4 says, These are the births of the heavens and the earth. In the usual translations, that's translated as generations. The Hebrew there is the word toldot, which means, which translates as generations, but the word toldot means to bring forth to birth. So when it says here, these are the this is the birthing of the heavens and the earth. And no shrub, here's what I was saying earlier, no shrub of the field is, is yet in the earth. No shrub is. The seeds are the shrub is. And no root of the field yet sprouts, for Yehovah God hath not rained upon the earth, and a man there is not to serve the ground. And a mist goes up from the earth and has watered the whole face of the ground. And Yehovah, God, forms the man, dust from the ground, and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living creature. Now this, this is, a, this is a, 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 what they call a seminal verse. Ch uh, chapter 2, verse 7. This, you know, they, so far, it's been kind of, kind of applicable, but this verse is a seminal verse. So uh, last week we, had, we we talked about the three words that are in this verse that, that we all need to, to go and research. Has anybody had an opportunity to do that? The three words we, that are part of this verse. Okay. We're all busy. But we all yeah. need to do this. You know, you want to be Bereans, right? Yeah. So we need to do this. There are three words. This word here. Breathe, breathe, comes from the word nafach, N-A-P-H-A-C-H. And if you look at all the times that that word is used in the Old Testament, it's going to say that it's a force of air. It's used as a force of air. Uh, it's either blowing or it's it's used to describe the air that comes out of the bellows that they would use to heat up a, a, uh, an oven to melt brass or iron. You, know, you can't just, you have to have a certain temperature to handle those things, so you've got to blow it around to make it a little hotter. And so the bellows that do that, the air that comes out, is described by the word nafah. That's the concept of nafah, it's forcing it. The second word is, the second thing we need to look at is uh, a nostrils, the breath of life, right here. And that comes from the Hebrew word neshema. Neshema, if you look at all the time that this word is used in the Old Testament, it's used uh, 24 times, I believe. If you look at this word that's used in the Old Testament, it always refers to the spirit of life that animates the clay. 
but it's never used in the sense that it is autonomous and conscious from the body. Mm -hmm. It's always about the spirit that animates the clay. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the, the um, one of the uh, uh, comparisons that we might use is that when you have a light bulb, it's dead. When you turn electricity on, boom, it comes alive. Mm -hmm. So the electricity is the neshama for that bulb. It comes alive when the electricity is applied. And that's the same kind of thing that we're talking about here, the breath of life animated the clear, the, the clay form. The man, the atom, was made from the clay, formed into a sculpture. With a blowing of his breath, the father installed in this clay form the spirit of life, and he turned on. He became a living being. And the last word is that living being part, which is right here, living creature. Living creature in this translation, uh, living being in many other translations, and living soul in some translations. Um, just know that when it uses the word soul, it's very confusing. Because, because when it says the word soul, it's, it's talking the language of this guy. The word is nefesh, and the word nefesh, if you look up that word, appears in all kinds of places in the Bible. And especially in the creation days, the, the, the cattle and the behemoths that were created are referred to as nefesh. They're living beings. Now blood, warm blood most of the time, living beings, the ones that breathe air. In verse eight, and Yahuwah God planted a garden in Eden, at the east, and he said it there, the man whom he had formed. The word Eden, you know what the word Eden means? It means pleasure. It's a garden of pleasures. Of every kind. Uh, every kind. And he said it the man there whom he had formed. And Verse 9, and Yahuwah God caused to sprout from the ground every tree desirable, desirable for appearance and good for food, and the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And uh, so it, with that verse, we're seeing that the seeds now had their first initial crop. They had grown up, and one thing, one thing uh, that I didn't notice until, one thing I noticed just recently was that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was one of them. Knowledge of tree of the knowledge of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is one of those trees that grew up. So God said, "Don't eat of that one." But He saw it was good. He thought it was good. Yeah. But he, he put it there for a reason. So remember, we talked about. I'm glad. Thank you. So um, we talked about how God was there. He. And we, I think we would all agree, this is not stated in the scripture, but I think it, it makes sense to say that God did not expect for Adam to be dumb for eternity, to be completely clueless for eternity. Would you agree with me on that? So if that's true, and I believe it is, then God was there to teach him stuff through eternity. Right. Man would have received knowledge of creation, himself, the world, love, and everything, he would have received all this information from his creator, from his father. Right. So, when we got to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Adam and Eve were, were faced with a decision to trust dad, mm -hmm. to trust their father, or to trust themselves. Because here was an alternate source of knowledge, according to Lucifer, according to the serpent. An alternate source of knowledge was to get this knowledge from this tree, instead of from the other guy, and from the creator. Lucifer is the other guy. So when, when he was talking to them, he says, has God really said? He was questioning the teaching, the authority that the creator had given them. And he was pushing them to find out for themselves. So he was, he was pushing them to self-aggrandize and take this, this struggle for knowledge into their own hands and, 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 and 
do what they were going to do to come to a different kind of knowledge that the fathers not provide. So let's go on, move on. Any questions on any of that? Do you think there's any correlation or anything with why he breathed into his <coughs> nostrils? Because I mean, the, the strong says nostrils or long suffering. I wonder if there's something, I know we're not at that level yet of interpretation, but is there something with that too? So I, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. Can you say it? Again? When it said that God breathed into his nostrils, uh -huh. we always think of mouth, like CPR, you always breathe in the mouth to plug the nose. What was there anything about the nostrils that we were missing in the Greek that maybe in Hebrew it means something more? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I think the obvious thing is, is that they saw that we breathe through our nostrils. Yeah. So the explanation was we force the air in the nostrils and we're going to go. Okay. All right. So, um, Man was not autonomous. He existed in a covenant relationship with the Creator. He had this relationship with the Creator. His existence was entirely dependent upon whether or not he continued to subordinate himself to the Father's will in the covenant. And that covenant was to eat of that tree. And the consequence was, if he didn't eat of the tree, he would live. But the other side of that consequence was, if he ate of the tree, he would die. Now, when we read this text, we have to read it for what it says, right? <laughs> what does it say? In the day that you eat of it, you will die. It's clearly in the Hebrew. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's got a special kind of grammatical construct that says dying, starting to die, you will die as a process until you're dead. Dying, you will die. And it, it's, it's it pronounced mut talud. And it's the absolute, it's called an absolute infinitive. Absolute infinitives are used all over the place in, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament. We'll, we'll, as we go on and I see them, I'll point them out to you. But what, what an absolute infinitive does is it's, it, I use the word juxtapose. Um, if you need a dictionary for that, I did at one point. If you need a dictionary to understand what that means, it means that you take something and you butt it up against something else that may, may be entirely different. So in the apps, in the absolute infinitive grammatical construction, what you do is you're, you're butting up a process to an event. So he starts to die, he dies until the event of death completes it. And that's, that's the absolute infinitive. And we'll see this, this played somewhere else too as we go on. So what it says is that if you don't, if you eat of that tree, you're gonna die and you'll return to dust. You go back to that place that I took you from. You go back to that chaos from which I created you as a structured being, as a structured living being. So we come down to man in the garden on the Sabbath. He had, this, he had authority, he had his choice. He was commanded to be fruitful and multiply again before he sinned. So the expectation, potential expectation was that he would, he would live forever making kids and having pleasure in the garden. Yes. Okay. I know we've had this conversation, but I just want to throw it out there. You can shut her down if you want to. <laughs> um, if we're reading the text as it is, shouldn't that not be spoken of as the man, but the person? Because it wasn't just a man. It was a man and woman still as one. It was mankind. It was ha -adam. Shouldn't that be... When we're reading in Genesis 2, any place that says he, I mean, even, I mean, my complete Jewish Bible, it, it says it, the person, not the man. Because it wasn't only a man, because there was another thing, there was a, a, a feminine part of him that was still connected to him until she was removed, according to how I understand it. There is a, there is a truth in that, and I agree with you. And we're actually going to talk, hopefully, we're going to talk about that today. 
So, um, okay, let's just go on. It's a good point, and that's very important because one of the other things that we, one of the things that is not on this list, that should be, if you get your, if you get your, your document, but you put this, put this on your list. One of the, one of, after, after, let's say, H, after the letter H, put in another thing that says names. Put it? Name. Names. Oh, name. Name. <coughs> names. Names. This, I believe, answers Stacy's question. We'll talk about it. So here in verse 10, it talks about the rivers, and I'm going to skip the rivers thing because I, I have not been led to understand really the significance of that yet. So I'm going to just say, let's, let's just jump over that for the moment. And go to verse 15. And Jehovah God, Take up the man and cause him to causes him to rest in the garden of Eden, to serve it and to keep it. And Jehovah God layeth a charge on the man and commanded him, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou dost eat, and of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thus thou dost not eat of it. For in the day of thine eating of it, dying, thou dost die. And Jehovah God saith, not not good for the man to be alone. I do make him a helper as his counterpart. Now, <coughs> counterpart is a good idea, and it's pretty close to the Hebrew idea, but we'll come back to that and talk about it. But, so, the next verse actually says that he's going to find a counterpart <coughs> for, for, for the Adam. And Stacy is right when she says, early on in the first, almost the first three chapters entirely, the Adam doesn't have a name. He is called the Adam, or mankind, or the creature that's made after the image of God. He doesn't have a name yet. Only until you get to verse 17 of chapter 3 does his does the word Adam become a proper name and there's there's so much more to this that I don't know yet that I'm researching but I'm going to tell you a couple of things about what I do know and which what I believe so but we'll get there in just a moment so names got names there now, let, and letter I there, let's, let's talk about this real quick because this is part of the foundational structure. So far, we've read through this, the scriptures of what they said. We, we've talked numerous times about the similar subjects. And based upon that, and actually you had homework to do that made you think about this as well. So what it says here is the fall and the definition of redemption, otherwise known as salvation. So the fall was, what was the fall of man? All of man was to eat that fruit. He violated the covenant. Therefore, the, the, the penalty for breach of covenant was empowered, came upon him, and he started to die. So when we talk about redemption, and we will, uh, in chapter 3, remember God told, told uh, uh, Eve and the serpent about her seed and his seed? That was a promise of redemption. That is also a very germane verse to, to look at and think about. A very critical verse to, to the structure. But when we talk about redemption, what have we been taught that redemption means in our churches and, and synagogues? Redemption means to buy back. Think about that. <laughs> Buying back from what? To what? What did we lose? Where are we now from which we need to be bought back and go back to what? 
original relationship is safe in God. Amen. And where is that? In the garden. In the garden. Right. So what we lost, the, the, the result of sin was that we were going to die, and Adam died. And the redemption was, he, he <coughs> fixed it so he didn't have to stay dead and put him back in the garden. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This is foundational. The rest of the Bible depends upon this. So, salvation has to be defined, has to be defined relative to what we lost. When Adam and Eve sinned, they did not inherit hell, as we understand that from Socrates. Mm -hmm. They did not inherit Hades. Their inner soul did not go anywhere because according to scripture that you just read in Genesis 2 7 they don't have a soul <coughs> in Genesis 2 7 what it says is they became a living being to say, to say it in to say it in the same language of some of our interpretations they did not get a soul they were a soul we don't have a soul we are one and me is my body and my, my spirit, my spirit of life. Nowhere in Genesis when we talk about the construction of man are we given any idea that there is a consciousness in us that can survive our death. Now, what did Lucifer tell Eve? Sure, you She's, well, what he said, first of all, he said, what has God told you? And she said, we can't eat of that tree. Or we can't even, she said, we can't even touch it. Yeah. We're not going to go there today. <laughs> but she, she repeated back to him part, most of what God said. You shall surely die. What did Lucifer say? You shall not surely die. What he told you will happen is not going to happen. What's going to happen is you are going to be empowered and be raised to the level of where he is and you shall be like him, and you will be God's. But the mantra that Lucifer has continued to tell mankind mm -hmm. since then yeah. is you shall not surely die. Mm. So every religion, every philosophy on this planet that has ever taught that we have a soul that goes somewhere when we die, guess where that teaching came from? Right here. <coughs> came from Lucifer. Because that contravenes the command of God. God said, if you eat of that fruit, you're going to be dead. Satan said, Lucifer said, uh-uh, not going to happen. But it happened. They grew, they grew old and they died. They turned to dust. Yeah. Do you think that part of the problem with that is because of the, the, the Greco mindset versus the Hebrew mindset where, well, it meant she ate the tree, she didn't die. Like, I remember as a kid reading, I'm thinking, she ate the apple, she didn't die, because we think immediate. Everything's right then. Yes. Because we think line upon line. But the Hebrew thing is, she did die. She started, in dying, she started to die. Yeah. And so that's why Satan can buy that lie to everybody, because they'll read that even and say, yeah, she didn't die when she right. ate the tree. So right. Satan right. was right. Right. So, the fact that they didn't keel over on the spot yeah. lends credence to the teaching that he teaches. And we'll talk, like, it goes more in depth than that. If you, one of the thought processes in seminaries, and this this is really this will get real deep real quick. Let's take a break first. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minute break. <laughs> Ten minute break. <laughs>